Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back to another session of the Prophet Sallallahu and I. Today we are entering our ninth session. So we are just one more session away from concluding this series, inshallah. Uh, it's been a great journey and I hope it's been of benefit, but uh, still a lot more of the blessed sirah, blessed biography of the Prophet Sallallahu to be uh, discussed. So inshallah, let's go ahead and let's dive in to the sirah at this point. If you recall, last time in session eight, we had covered the aftermath of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. We talked about the Battle of Khaybar. We talked about uh, the international invitation of Islam, that how the Prophet had sent, uh, had sent uh, emissaries to go uh, and give the message to uh, the uh, empires of Persia, of uh, Byzantium, of uh, the uh, Abyssinians, and so on and so forth. And so the Prophet mm -hmm. was sending out these delegations there. And we also talked about how life was during Mecca, uh, during the time of peace. And inshallah, I hope to be able to talk a little bit more about that, but uh, perhaps that might be something we can close out with, how the Prophet was in his everyday life. And we talked about some tidbits here and there, but uh, th those are absolutely go without uh, can't go without any mention uh, in, in that sense. And then lastly, we ended with the talk of the conquest of Mecca. So today we pick up where we left off uh, in that we talk about the conquest of Mecca in just its aftermath, just simply just to preface over what we had uh, talked about last time, uh, just to lift up some significant aspects of that conquest before we transition into what happened after the conquest of Mecca. So just to uh, refresh, um, the conquest of Mecca was largely a peaceful uh, transition of power from the Muslims, uh, from the Quraysh to the Muslims. Uh, as was discussed, the Muslims had entered the city with an army of over 10,000 uh, combatants. However, there was no official battle or any type of widespread massacre or anything like that that took place. There were small skirmishes that had taken place. And uh, if you would even call those skirmishes, you have in this sense, uh, you know, the you have you have essentially the um, you know Muslims coming in and you have some folks who are just resisting per se who are just trying to uh, you know hold on to their vestiges that they've got and so there's small skirmishes here and there but largely and overwhelmingly a peaceful takeover that that ensues and so uh, now as as the Prophet ﷺ is entering uh, Mecca as he's entering the holy precincts of the Kaaba he does not come into Mecca with, uh, you know, a flag raised and him holding a sword or anything triumphant like you might see of a conqueror. He comes with his uh, head bent. He comes with his back bent. He comes basically in prostration, uh, in, in, in a sense of submission, as you, as you would during prayer. This is the type of body language that he is exhibiting to the folks who he is, uh, he is uh, quote unquote, conquering or he, who he has just conquered, that he is entering into the city, into the sanctuary not to cause bloodshed or not to wage war, but to come in humility. He had uh, earlier before the actual um, co conquest itself, right at the right at the precipice of it, had told a companion who had who had uh, spoken to Abu Sufyan that uh, this will be a day of slaughter. And the Prophet ﷺ admonished him and said, no, this is not a day of slaughter. This is a day of mercy. And we know oftentimes when the Prophet ﷺ talks about mercy, he himself lifts up concepts that such as the one who does not show mercy to others will not be shown mercy to. And he doesn't uh, give himself as the exception to the rule. He, uh, by all means, leads by example in this regard. And so the conquest of Mecca was no different. We see that during, not just in terms of, you, you, you also pay attention in the conquest of Mecca, not just in the fact that the conquest of Mecca was something that happened and it was peaceful. These are uh, very overlapping terms that are true, but I think the, the meaning oftentimes gets lost when we see the significance of the certain actions that the Prophet does, starting first and foremost with how he entered into the city, how he entered 
uh, humbly and not in a way that would cause terror. He entered in a way that would cause curiosity, that would uh, cause some humility. He didn't enter in a way that caused fear for anybody. And then when getting there, he honored the traditions that existed with the exceptions of the ones that had gone contrary to the Islamic message. He had honored the traditions such as receiving water from uh, Zamzam, from his uncle Abbas, who, were, uh, who he and his family were known to be the uh, waterers of the pilgrim, and then giving the keys of the Kaaba to uh, Uthman ibn Talha, and then his descendants, and you know, in, entrusting certain things to people uh, as they were prior to Islam, and then also starting new traditions which went against the grain, but traditions which uh, set the precedent for the Muslim community going forward. And uh, foremost amongst these were the uh, adhan, the call to prayer given by Bilal at the top of the Kaaba. Just recall less than uh, less than 20 years before, less than 15 years before, Bilal was someone who was at uh, the bottom of the Meccan society, literally and figuratively. We recall that he was not only enslaved, but he was someone who was taken out and repeatedly tortured in the fields outside Mecca and with hot stones put on him saying that ahadun ahad saying that god is one he is one he is one and now he was at the highest point of mecca giving this message that there is no god but god uh, and that the prophet sallam is his messenger and to come to prayer to come uh, to islam and to, to to come in this aspect and so you see this reversal this this symbolism that is taking place it's not by any accident but the prophet sallam exactly knows how uh, and what he needs to do besides just coming in and instilling fear uh, uh, as might be naturally seen as the course of action when being pushed out of a city, when being persecuted, and now returning home to the same people that uh, martyred people like his uncle, people like uh, the, his closest companions, and still being coming to them in a sense of forgiveness. So we talked last time how uh, the Prophet ﷺ echoed a statement of uh, Yusuf ﷺ for the Prophet Joseph when he uh, announced to his brothers when they came for forgiveness that let there be no blame on you this day. He said to the Quraysh, God will forgive you. Allah is the most merciful of the merciful. And uh, he, he recites a verse from Surah Hujrat uh, that the, that, you know, a very famous verse that uh, God has created you in different nations and tribes that you might come to know one another. And so uh, Allah has eliminated from you this pride of jahiliyyah, this pride of ancestry, of lineage and whatnot, and to hold each other up tied in the uh, brotherhood and sisterhood of Islam. And so we see a number of conversions that come that wouldn't really appear to us as, uh, as something of significant or probably raising some eyebrows, but we see people who were at the exact diametric opposite of who the Prophet ﷺ was, what his mission was, coming to pledge their allegiance. We see the sons of Abu Lahab, Abu Lahab who has a chapter of the Quran uh, named for him infamously in that sense, um, being led to the Kaaba by the Prophet and being prayed directly with them. We see the son of Abu Jahl who was named as the Pharaoh of the Ummah, as the Pharaoh of the Prophet Sallallahu community because of his opposition, because of his sheer ignorance towards the message and his persistent persecution of the Muslims, we see that the son of Abu Jahl is honored when he comes to accept Islam. And the Prophet even goes as far as instructing his companions to say, don't insult his father. Don't, in, don't call him Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl is you know, the father of the ignorant, the father of, uh, of the Jahl, but uh, his actual name was Abu Al-Hakam. He said, don't call him Abu Jahl. Don't say anything that will hurt, uh, that will hurt Ikrima because nobody can be held responsible for someone else's mistakes, especially in a society that placed that much significant for one's tribe, one's father, one's lineage. You were essentially, uh, you, you had in this society that if your tribe, you might've been a very dislocated member, but you are a member of a tribe. If your tribe goes and does something, you by affiliation are responsible or you're held accountable. And this is what Islam came to uh, to address, especially with regards to the concept of belief, with the concept of disbelief, and with the concept of forgiveness. And so we see the Prophet overwhelming this day with the not just a rhetoric of mercy, but with an action of mercy that's there. Uh, we talked how he stayed in 19 days in Mecca, um, and then he even, you know, when, when we talk about that his mercy was not just limited to rhetoric, we see that his mercy was also something that was, uh, that was extended to those who sought to do harm to him, even as they had, they had come to accept Islam. One of these people was named Fudala. 
Fudala was someone who uh, had uh, was was in Mecca uh, and during one of the circumambulations uh, of the Kaaba had made an intention to uh, assassinate the Prophet and the Prophet had uh, had you know caught him off guard in the action and you know said that hey don't don't try it don't do it um, and you, you you see the Prophet take this in, in in a kind of joke and you know Fudala made it made a remark uh, to my recollection at that time that you know there was nobody more. Uh, you know, hated to me than the Prophet ﷺ. And at that moment, there's nobody more beloved to me than the Prophet ﷺ. This, you know, Prophet ﷺ just kind of touched his chest and uh, was like, hey man, you know, th 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 this isn't the place for that. Don't, don't, don't try it. We know, we know, God's watching. We know what you're going to do. And you, you see the Prophet ﷺ dealing with someone like this in, in mercy with, with someone who's aiming to actively hurt him, but for the sake of showing, not just saying what mercy is, but to show that divine mercy, the Prophet ﷺ takes it to even those who want to inflict harm on him, even at the 11th hour. <clears throat> After the conquest of Mecca, we have the Battle of Hunayn. And as I mentioned in previous sessions, I strongly encourage you to go ahead and check out in the syllabus, I have linked uh, the uh, famous biography, the uh, earliest, uh, the life of the Prophet Muhammad based on the earliest sources by Martin Lings and all these battles go into incredible detail with different traditions, different interactions with different companions. So I don't want to do it any injustice by not being able to tell the different facets and different details. So uh, we're, we're going to go through it, but I really strongly encourage you all to look at that uh, to see a fuller picture of what these battles entailed. Because oftentimes when we think about in our context, we think battles, we just limit it to swords and shields and just fighting and bloodshed and whatnot. But there's a lot of lessons that are learned in these battles, especially when it comes to interactions of the Prophet with other people. But in any case, the Battle of Hunayn took place against the tribe of Hawazin or the Confederation of Hawazin, a uh, large tribe outside to the south of Mecca around Ta'if and you know, had, had traditionally been hostile to the uh, the Islamic cause. And so uh, you have a large army of over, you know, reports of having over 20,000 troops uh, led by a 30 year old named uh, Malik ibn Of. So a, a young commander, but a very good commander uh, in strategically. And the Prophet had in his army, the initial 10,000 who had come to uh, Mecca, who had come to the conquest of Mecca, but interestingly also had added 2,000 Quraysh converts, as well as some Meccans who had not yet entered Islam, but who had uh, who had been resourceful, who were able to help the army, but had yet had not yet helped uh, to, or had not yet joined the cause. Amongst them included people like Suhail ibn Amr, who, if you recall, was the father of Abu Jandal, and he was the one who was at the treaty um, with the Prophet ﷺ after Hudaybiyah, uh, and he his son was the one who ran to the camp. While in while in shackles and said, please take me, please take me. And Suhail ibn Amr took him back and said, he's not part of the deal. And so this is Suhail, Suhail ibn Amr. He was known as a man of very uh, strong wisdom of, uh, you know, good general, good character, but a, a noble person. But uh, still, he was someone who was not uh, settled upon Islam. And another person you had, Safwan ibn Umayyah. Uh, and you he he had loaned, uh, in a sense, a uh, a number of armor for the, the troops. And so you see that these people hadn't accepted the message of Islam yet, but they were still incorporated into this battle, into this cause. And so in Hunayn, which is uh, a battle that is one of uh, the few battles here mentioned by name in the Quran, you have uh, what started essentially as like an ambush, as a bit of a rout from the Muslims, uh, because they were ambushed by these tribes, of, this tribe of Hawazin, but the tide quickly turned. We, we see something very interesting in the sense that uh, by being ambushed, naturally the army that is being ambushed wants to flee back, wants to retreat. The troops at the front want to retreat. And the tide quickly turned, though, as the Prophet Sallam, apart from other folks that, that naturally would be seen as at the forefront, the Prophet Sallam, along with some close companions, called them back and called them back and said, you know, remember the oaths that you took. Remember the oath that we took at uh, Ridwan. We remember the oath we took at Hudaybiyah. Remember these oaths that we took. And calls them back. But we see in this case, just to, just to put a side note to it, the Prophet Sallam at this time, is approximately 61, 62 years old. You know, he, he, he's towards the end of his life. Um, he's an older person. By all means, he can lead this battle from behind. He has every right to be at the back and just command strategically like a general does, like someone uh, at his level 
does. But he, you can see, is in the throes of the battle. And so uh, you, you constantly think about when the Prophet, ﷺ, when we question, when we think about, you know, was this person a sincere person? Was this person really about his cause? Was he just, you know, making it up? Was, was What was the sincerity behind it? You see him willing enough to put his life on the line uh, that, that he would go into battle rather than just put other people forward and sacrifice other people's sons, uh, other people's daughters, uh, and putting them forth. He himself would be in the throes of it. And so there's very uh, significant amount of lessons we can derive from this, whether we are in leadership or whether we see it in our own leaders and whether they are willing to make the same sacrifices that they are asking of their community. And so as we go through the Battle of Hunayn, uh, eventually, uh, you know, the uh, tide turns, the Prophet ﷺ goes into leading the battle, and the Hawazin eventually retreat. A uh, number of them are ca uh, taken captive, uh, but in the aftermath is what's something more beautiful. Like I said, these battles are are, are very significant in their own respect, but it's all these in-betweens that are not conflict related, that you see the true uh, beauty, the true interactions, the true uh, gems of Islam and the Prophet ﷺ come to light. One of these is uh, in the aftermath of this, as I mentioned, there's a number of captives that were taken by the Muslims. And one of these was, uh, was a woman who had uh, told the, uh, her captors that she's the Prophet Sassam's foster sister. She said, I'm the Prophet Sassam's foster sister. And uh, you know, they brought her to the Prophet Sassam and she, he verified with them that yeah, she is. You know, her name was Shema, Shema bint al Harith, and she was the Prophet Sassam's foster sister. If we recall earlier in our sessions, the first or second session, we talked about how the Prophet Sassam, under the care of his mother, uh, was sent to live essentially with these Bedouins, was sent into the uh, into the desert to learn the ways of the true Arabs. It's just a custom that they had, and so uh, Halima and her husband Harith came to the Prophet's mother and took uh, the Prophet Sassam. Uh, with them uh, as a way to nurse them, to take care of them, and to raise them. And Shema was the daughter of Halima. And the Prophet ﷺ, when hearing about not just who Shema was, when, when getting to remember who she was, almost 50, 60 years or so after the this account happened, you see uh, the Prophet ﷺ starts to shed tears by uh, meeting this person who he had only met as a child, but then also listening to the story of Halima, who was his uh, foster mother, of Hadith, his foster father, and uh, learning that, you know, they passed away, but the Prophet ﷺ still, as if it was yesterday, shedding tears for them. And so we see the Prophet ﷺ's connection. We talked about how the Prophet Sallam, after the death of his mother, almost 50 years later to the date, had gone back uh, and, you know, had, had gone on the road back to Medina and had stopped at, uh, at Abwa um, and had stopped at the place where she was buried and had told his companions when they found him weeping in front of this, in front of this grave that this is my mother. You know, he, he remembered from that time and even this time he remembered uh, almost 55 or so years down the line. And so now, uh, after the uh, campaign at Hunain, the Prophet ﷺ takes the army to go to Taif. Taif, a very famous city. We, we know from our discussion here, Taif was that city where the Prophet ﷺ went after Mecca had completely shut him out. He had decided to take some refuge and try to pitch his, his uh, message to Taif, but he was actually chased out very brutally, uh, being stoned by the children and ridiculed by the elders that were there. So safe to say he didn't have a good experience in Taif. But Taif was kind of the center of where this army was operating at. And so Taif was naturally the next location to uh, move on to. It was a, but it is a mountaintop uh, type of a village or a town, and it's very well fortified. And the Muslims spent about a month trying to besiege it and eventually had said, you know what, we, we have uh, better things to do. They, the, the siege was not wholly successful in that aspect. And so the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslim departed. But what's very interesting in this aspect is that when the Prophet ﷺ had taken his message to Taif and he was driven out, he was stoned, he was driven out, and he found some respite under a tree, it was given to him, it was revealed to him that if you would like this, uh, it was a, a kind of conveyed in a sense from an angel, conveyed this, that if you would like, for what they have done, we will uh, basically we can turn these we can we can put these uh, this town between two mountains. We can essentially just remove this village and these people off the face of the earth for the insult that they have done. 
to the prophet and to God. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, you know, don't do that because it may be that some people in there, in that town may become Muslim, that their children might become Muslim. And so the Prophet ﷺ had asked for clemency for them. And what's really interesting at this stage in his life, when the Prophet ﷺ is essentially regarded as mostly the undisputed ruler of Arabia, he also is given the same option, but his fellow Muslims say that Prophet ﷺ, you know, you can do so many things, you have a connection with Allah, curse dive. You know, th these people are just like, they're, they're stubborn, they're doing all this, curse them, please, just, just, get, just get rid of them, we can't, fin we can't finish our siege, just curse them. And the Prophet ﷺ says, no, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to curse them, and instead he prays for them. He prays for them that they might be guided, that the people of the village might be guided. And so we think about that connection that the Prophet ﷺ was someone consistent, even in the face of such adverse, um, you know, just opposition. We see the Prophet ﷺ in this regard has a history with Daif. It's not a good one. And he doesn't hold that as a grudge that, you know what, yeah, they treated me like crap like about 10 years ago. Uh, how about we, 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 we get them back now? You know, this is just natural. They're, they're at the point. Let's just, let's just do it. But no, he, he still believes that there is good in people, even if they are rejecting. So his, his uh, string that he has for people is quite long, but he has enough forbearance to know that there's better, there's more, um, there's more blessing in asking for the forgiveness of someone rather than invoking the curse on someone or rather than wanting vengeance. He knows that there's more benefit for the person who's invoking it as well as for the person who it's invoked for. And so after they go to the IF uh, and come back, there is a distribution of spoils as naturally done in war that time. You know, there, there's a number of uh, different cattle and other things like that that were captured. And so distributing this was just a custom. And so the Prophet ﷺ, seeing though the state of some of the captives, some of the prisoners of war, the first thing the Prophet ﷺ does is to order new garments for these captives and says that, hey, they're, they're not being treated 100% uh, right. They're not, you know, we, we need to make sure that they're being treated okay. And so the war ethic he's telling his commanders companions he's teaching his followers is that hey you know you don't just because you win in battle or just because you uh take over somebody in battle or anything like that doesn't mean they're not human doesn't mean you have the right to dehumanize them or anything like that still give them dignity give them uh what their basic necessities are and so he orders new garments for all the captives orders the uh, the captives especially the women and children and old people to be treated well and what's what causes a little bit of ire though and what's very interesting for us in this respect looking back on this is the Prophet ﷺ distributes a large amount of these spoils. You would think he would distribute it to the people who have been most committed to the cause, the people who've been there since day one. That's generally how our society works. That's generally how we we, we go about is that, uh, you know, we think that the people who've done the most, uh, who have been with you the longest, they deserve the, the, the best. And, you know, that, that has its truth in certain aspects. But in this case, the Prophet ﷺ distributed a large amount of those spoils to the newly converted and even the non-converted Quraysh who had just come to Islam but a few days ago uh, after the conquest. He, uh, it, it wasn't so much though for the loyal followers. The loyal followers who were there from day one, they didn't get as much of that. But uh, you, you see the Prophet ﷺ giving a large amount to the people who had held out the latest. And so it seems kind of confusing. But we oftentimes might think that this might be the Prophet ﷺ trying to buy their loyalty, like saying, hey, all right, you're not going to convert, at least just take this, uh, this, this, this share of the war spoils and just join us and just buy us off there. Rather, it's, 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 it's a deeper look into seeing how the Prophet ﷺ was cognizant, how some people's hearts are won over, that he knew that some people were still uneasy, some people were on the fence, some people had held out for a certain reason, not everybody was on that same plane. He knew that with his closest followers, all he had to do was just say something or just do something very simple, not even uh, anything material, and they would follow him at that point. But he knew some of the people in Mecca who uh, had been embedded in this concept of Jaili and this concept of uh, just, you know, tribalism, that to win to their heart, the key to their heart was something else. And that once you unlock that, uh, when you when you use that key and unlock their heart, then you can uh, bring in other elements of purification and change their values and help to show them that this isn't, this isn't all that's there. And so the Prophet ﷺ, as I mentioned, you know, goes uh, and gives the likes of Safwan, who's not a Muslim, who's, who sees this large field of spoils. And the Prophet ﷺ says, would, would you like that? And, you know, Safwan says, yeah. And 
he, the process system says, Hey, that's all yours. You know, take that everything that's there. That's yours. And he testifies that I can't, I can't imagine anyone this generous, uh, you know, from among my people or just in general, you have to be a prophet. There's no way that you would treat someone like me, uh, with this much favor. And so the prophet system wins their heart over, but reminds them that, Hey, these are just temporary. What you're seeing here, this, these spoils, these camels, these goats, these, uh, you know, all these different spoils. These are, these are just temporary. What's real is the bond that we have. What's real is the ever at the hereafter that is to come. So the prophet system inserts that, but he gives us this precedent when we talk to people, whether about Islam or whether about other things in our life. And we just see that, Hey, our methodology is not working. It worked for X amount of people why isn't it working for this person we'll automatically start to assume this person is just stubborn this person's not going to get it and we want to give up on that person uh rather the prophet sallallahu example shows us that different people have different keys to their hearts and we have to get to know those people we have to be aware of those people in order to see what is that key like and for some people it may be no key at all they may be very open and for other people it may be that you just go ahead and you have to work at unlocking their heart. And so as the Prophet Sallam is doing this, as naturally I mentioned, there is a sense of frustration. You might get a sense of frustration from reading it. There is a sense of frustration when people are there, especially from those who had been the folks to help the Prophet Sallam, who were there to give him refuge amongst the Ansar. The Ansar had said to, to the Prophet that maybe he's, you know, now that he's back in Mecca, maybe he's just forgotten us. You know, he's giving all the spoils of war to these people who just joined a few days ago or haven't even joined, but he hasn't given anything to us. Maybe his heart has turned back to just being in favor of his own people. And when the Prophet heard this, he had said he had gone to the Ansar, he had gone to this people, he had assembled them, and he said that, uh, you know, different words to lift them up. He had said different words to praise them, but most significantly, he had said that, you know, are you, you know, they, they are getting like the, 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 some of the spoils of this world. They're getting some, you know, camels and goats and things like that. They're getting these, you know, material things and they're returning back to their homes with that. But are you not glad that you are returning back home with the messenger of God? And that if all of the Ansar were to go one way and the rest of humanity was to go another way, I would go with the Ansar. And so hearing this, hearing this type of commitment, as mentioned that, you know, what, what was the key to these people heart, these people's hearts wasn't just the material. The material obviously eludes a lot of us and something that uh, deludes our judgment sometimes, but at their heart, they're very pure people. And so hearing this, they, they, they break down in tears. These are grown men crying. It's reported their beards are wet. Hearing this, that, that, that is what the process was trying to initiate that, you know, they're taking these material spoils that might be gone tomorrow, but you are taking the the prophet of God with you, and the prophet of God will be with you uh, until he passes. And so uh, you, you see this, this, this important lesson being taught that it's not always about the material things. It might look nice, it might feel nice for a little bit, but what's more significant is having that connection to God, having that connection to spirituality, having that connection to faith, which is something the people who are going away today with fields and fields of different spoils don't have. They, they don't have as much of that as what you, we, what you have. And so he knew that they would be, they would capitulate at this, that they were people who, uh, who may have been distracted here and so like any, any normal person by the wealth of this world, but that at their heart, what was truly longing was that sense of connection. Because if you remember what I just said at the beginning, their fear was that maybe he's going to leave us. Maybe he's just, you know, he's seen his family, he's seen his people, and he's just ready to dip and he's just ready to go with them. And rather he connects back and says, no, I'm going with you. He's like, forget about the stuff of this world. Like I'm coming back with you. And for them, that's what was satisfactory. It was, it was that it wasn't maybe so much of the spoils, but it was so much that will we lose the profit is, is were we just basically like an Airbnb for the last few years? Uh, no, the Prophet Sallam said, you are, you are now my home. You are my people. And so uh, we, we see the Prophet Sallam, uh, you know, start to go back to Medina with them. But before he does a delegation from the Hawaz and the tribe that was fighting them comes to reclaim the captives and the Prophet ﷺ, uh, returns those captives to them. The Prophet ﷺ shows them that mercy, doesn't uh, say, hey, you snooze, you lose, but goes to the people who had taken captives or taken any of the spoils and sense and had, has tried, it tries to convince them that, hey, they should be returned until they were returned back to this army. And so in that sense, we also see the Prophet ﷺ, uh, before he leaves back to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ performs the Umrah. He performs the Umrah, which is the minor pilgrimage uh, before he returns to Medina. 
And it's really important because Mecca was the home of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mecca was where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, where everything of his memories, his childhood memories, his early friendships, all these things, his first revelation, all these things uh, were in Mecca. Mecca was his home. And you recall when we talked that when he was leaving Mecca, he, he made a statement that, you know, you are my home, that, you know, I, 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 I miss you. Like, you know, he, he was very emotionally attached to Mecca. But it's so significant to see that despite what had happened, the Prophet Sallallahu had decided not to stay in Mecca, which was his hometown, which was where Khadija passed away, where some of his most fond memories were, that he chose to go to Medina as a way of acknowledging the sacrifice that the Ansar made, the people of Medina made, and a statement to the entire community, as uh, Raza Aslan says, that while Mecca was at the heart of Islam, the Prophet ﷺ showed him that the soul would always be in Medina. And so how Islam was practiced, Islam is heart is at Mecca, but how it's practiced, we see in the uh, in Medina. And so uh, we see then also just interestingly, a quick remark that on Mecca as well, we had prior to the uh, prior to Islam, a uh, economic impact of, you know, so many different proportions. But now as Mecca has become a an Islamic city as the as essentially the center for pilgrimage. We see that uh, the the economic impact of Mecca has also started to take. So people start to go to Medina. People start to go uh, and 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 assemble in Medina because of the larger economic opportunities, but also because Mecca is now becoming has become sacred sacralized per se. And so uh, it's very interesting though. The last thing I'll say on Hunayn. As the Prophet ﷺ has coming back from Hunayn, he makes an announcement to his community that we are returning from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. And uh, what, what his companions ask is like, what, what do you mean the lesser jihad and the greater jihad? What, are, aren't they the same? Like, what, what's the difference? But he instills again in his companion that we are not a religion of warfare. We're not a people that are just uh, out for war, just like that. That's, that was a source of pride for us maybe back in the day. That was a source of pride for us before Islam. But we are coming back from the lesser jihad, alluding to war, towards the greater jihad, talking about the struggle of self, talking about just making thing, making ends meet, talking Talking about raising families, doing do, you know, doing your business, uh, harvesting crops, these these daily things, doing your prayers, all these different things. But that battle was something that's a lesser jihad. And so the Prophet ﷺ wanted to instill these values in a people whose background was defined by essentially violence, was defined by uh, pride, was defined by warfare, was defined by this uh, this thing called murua or this type of chivalry or this you know this type of toxic masculinity you might want to call it, this this overt masculinity and wanting to reverse that and saying no that the greater jihad is that of the self. An example of this we talked about that uh, when we see the Prophet in the community, he wasn't somebody that was detached from his community and said, hey, by all means, he probably had the right for this, but he didn't tell his community, hey, build me uh, my own home with my own palaces, with all this stuff uh, that needs to be this size and this great. He had simply um, you know, shown them uh, how to be a member of the community, how to be a good Muslim by the attestations of his wives. When asked how the Prophet was, like, what did he do? Like, how was how was he at home? Like, did he lounge all day? Like, what, what how did he make y'all work? Uh, Aisha was asked in the Prophet, and she had responded, the Prophet was someone who mended his own clothes. He was somebody that fixed his shoes. He was someone that milked his own goats. He was somebody who did the house chores. He was just a regular person. But the Prophet showing them that this is not something that's just you know, exclusive to women. This is not something that men are not supposed to do. The Prophet ﷺ changing the psyche of this of these people was not so much that, hey, we're, we're now shifting from one side of the spectrum to the other, but gradually we are going to make a total, total transformation of who we are. And so by lifting up the fact that we're leaving the lesser jihad for the greater jihad, and by modeling it, we see that the Prophet ﷺ was not just someone who uh, came to spread a message just to say that, uh, you know, or just did it for, for the sake of gaining followers or prestige or whatnot. He absolutely could have convinced his people and probably told them to say, hey, uh, you know, build me a palace, build me this, do this, do that. He would have, he, you know, his people probably would have capitulated, but he uh, he suffered alongside them. He worked alongside them. And so it shows us true leadership. It shows us true faith is not that where we take hold of something or we're given authority and we're going to just operate from one space and treat people uh, like anything else or just pretend like we are relieved of these obligations. The Prophet ﷺ was given one of the heaviest, if not the heaviest obligation upon humanity and still with that managed to go do basic things around the house, uh, help his wife clean the house, help his wife feed uh, the kids, help do all these different 
different things um, and, and helped uh, all these all these different things that were going on. So we see in this example, the Prophet was uh, leading by example, not as someone dislocated, but someone who isn't a model for us in our time right now, how we can be good husbands or better husbands or better wives or, uh, you know, better just partners in general to the people around us. And so he led by example in that aspect. So as the Prophet is returning to Medina, uh, we are coming now to the birth of Ibrahim, his son. Uh, so his son Ibrahim was born in uh, what was born uh, from Maria. Uh, Maria was an Egyptian, uh, an Egyptian Coptic Christian. Uh, so his son uh, Ibrahim was born after the expedition or the Battle of Hunain and the return from the Umrah. And so just wanted to make a quick clarification on this, because I know this might cause some confusion. And it is a bit of a sensitive topic because there, there, there is some uh, there's a, some difference in opinion that is on there. But just wanted to clarify on this. So uh, there's sometimes some confusion with regards to uh, the status of Maria. Maria is uh, sometimes seen by uh, some folks as a uh, as a wife of the Prophet and you know no no issue there at all. No, you know being being a wife of the Prophet uh, and enjoying the, the benefits as such. And then there's the other side um, that uh, for a good amount of tradition has seen the Prophet has uh, seen Maria as uh, a concubine or as a, uh, a a female servant of the uh, Prophet or a uh, bondswoman per se. And so there is. A, a, a number of more scholarly and deeper articles that can go into this that can go into more detail. I just want to give a quick preface of it uh, just for the sake of stating it. And then, like I said, I'll try to post uh, whether in the WhatsApp or via email, share some articles that have uh, the, uh, you know, the arguments for both sides. And like I said, for, for our purposes here, when we look at it, wh which, whichever way history goes, um, we, we arrive at the same conclusion. We, we have in the Quran, the Prophet is listed as the example for all of humanity. And we also know that the Prophet some lived in a society that was very different from our own. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, everything that was done in that society was in a vacuum. Everything we do in our society is in a vacuum. There are a number of overlaps, but there are a number of things that are unique to that society. You know, how's, how are we going to assess what the Prophet some would say about social media or things like that? So it's hard to, to you know, project our uh, our standings and our understandings and our values onto that society and say, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Uh, and same, vice versa. But uh, it's just important to note that, um, you know, Maria, it, what's agreed upon is that she was a Coptic Christian. She was from Egypt, and she was someone who was sent or gifted by the uh, prefect of Egypt, the Mokokus, the ruler at the time. I don't know if it's my ruler because uh, Egypt was under the uh, Byzantine um, uh, the Byzantine Empire. And so uh, in this sense, the Mokokus was the prefect or the ruler had received a letter. As I mentioned, there was an invitations or the invitations to Islam sent internationally. And amongst those was sent to uh, Egypt. And the, the Mokokus there had not done to the Prophet's invitation what some other rulers had done, like the Kisra of uh, Persia. He had not ripped up the uh, letter or of invitation. He hadn't cursed it. He had simply declined it. He had said he had he would just said that my, my religion is for me. I respect you, but uh, the, you know I, I, I'm fine where I'm at. And uh, as a gesture, you know, tradition has that he sent uh, a number of gifts to the Prophet son, from like a donkey to uh, some gold, as well as uh, two sisters who were uh, understood to be of uh, some royal lineage or of, of noble lineage, uh, and they were Maria and Sirin. And so some people will say that. They were slaves that were sent over. They were servants that were sent over, um, or they were just people who were gifted because you know the values of that uh, of that society are also just in that context different from the values of the uh, the, the Muslim society of the Islamic society. But in any case, Maria and Sirin are uh, are you know come from Egypt to Medina, and the Prophet ﷺ, uh, takes Maria into his house, uh, and Sirin is given to another companion. Um, Hassan ibn Thabit. Uh, but like I said, they're sisters, but they're also in a foreign land. So don't forget that when we talk about Madia, we don't want to just brush her off to the side. She's someone who's center to this to this story. And so just imagine for her, there's probably a big language barrier. She doesn't speak Arabic or probably doesn't know uh, the, the 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 language of, of the Muslims there. And so she's she's in a foreign land. And so at that point, though, there is a question of, you know, did the Prophet take her in and marry her? Some reports have it that he married her. 
There's other reports that um, she was she was not in the Prophet's home per se, but she had her own home outside of Medina. And it's generally agreed that she had her home outside of Medina, whereas the wives of the Prophet had uh, their homes built kind of next to the mosque. But again, like I said, there are different reports that say that she was married. There's other reports that say she was not married. But at the end of the day, uh, what, what it comes down to as well is that uh, she had, um, whether by one way or another here, had uh, given birth to the son of the Prophet Sallallahu Ibrahim. And now what's to say is that, you know, there's, there's also uh, a bit of controversy when it comes to, you know, did the Prophet Sallallahu have a child from someone who he was not married to? As I mentioned that, you know, that's, that's a deep dive into this, and I definitely don't want to do it any injustice. But in this case, the Prophet Sallallahu was, uh, whether she was a wife, whether she was someone who uh, was a uh, female servant, whether she was a bondswoman in that aspect, she did, uh, as, as understood, come as a Christian. She did come to this land as a Christian. Um, and so for one, for one reason or another, whether she was as a bondswoman or as a wife, uh, she did have uh, that faith difference. But in later life, she did become a Muslim. So after giving birth to Ibrahim, she uh, did become a Muslim. And later on, uh, her funeral prayer was led by the second Khalifa of Islam, of, by Omar. So uh, like I said, I don't want to cause too much confusion that's on there. I probably already caused enough. But for my purpose here, as, as I aim to uh, just go through the seerah, I'm not aiming to teach the seerah. I'm aiming to just go through uh, what, what is already there and just kind of explore it from a different angle. It's to show that regardless of the fact that if the Prophet had uh, Maria as his wife, or if she was as a bondswoman, for us as Muslims today, it's important for us to, one, just hold back on projecting our straight, like specific values that we have ingrained uh, in postmodernism and to just project it back and to really do our due diligence to first off, take a look, to study, to, to read through that rather than just being like, oh, that's offensive in my time. So it must be offensive. Then no, you know, we, we need to do it. It's due diligence. It's hard to do that, uh, do justice to uh, a society that's almost 13, 1400 years away. And especially uh, in the context of the Prophet Islam, in the context of Islam, we definitely want to ask tough questions, but we also want to do it in from a lens of respect. And so uh, regardless of what happened, though, we, we know that Maria was someone that had given birth to the son of the Prophet Sallallahu And that in and of itself has an honor that no other wife of the Prophet Sallallahu aside from Khadija has. We know that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, only had children with Khadija. He had uh, two boys who had passed away in infancy, and he had four daughters, and uh, three of those passed away in his lifetime. And so uh, Ibrahim coming uh, in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu you can imagine this was just a, a, a huge relief, especially in a society where the Prophet Sallallahu was ridiculed, where the Prophet Sallallahu was uh, derided, because ha not having a male uh, coming after you in your lineage, that, that means your lineage ends. There's a cut, you know, so people would tease him that your lineage isn't going to continue. You just have daughters. Like, what are you going to do? You don't even have a son. And so when he had this son, you have this aspect just imagine the Prophet uh, he did uh, do this. He would take him, uh, Ibrahim, around. He would take him around and show him to people. He would show him. So it shows you that there is pride in Ibrahim. If this was like an illicit relationship or something that was, uh, that was you know, not to be uh, you know, celebrated at, the Prophet you wouldn't imagine him to be uh, parading this child that, hey, you know, Maria just had a son. This is, Maria just had a son, my son, you know, Ibrahim. And so the Prophet in doing that, in announcing how he's uh, having this pride for Ibrahim, it gives that respect as well to Maria, uh, that Maria has this, uh, this respect owed to her as well. So he's taking Ibrahim, this baby around, showing him, announcing in the masjid that, you know, my son has been born. I name him after my father, Abraham, Ibrahim. And, you know, you see this joy that the Prophet Sallallahu gets after 62 years, after uh, over, you know, 20 years of being as a prophet, seeing so much heartbreak, Imagine just what this child brings in terms of that. Just, just see, like, you know, it's part of you also thinks that the prophet's like, you know, answering the critics and be like, yeah, you know, here you go. I got a kid too. I got a son. Um, so there's just so much that, that is coming there, but uh, you see him overjoyed at this. And uh, we, we, we see that there, there's so much uh, that can be said, not just about the Prophet and his love for Ibrahim, because we're going to come to a very sad uh, scenario and uh, sad situation in just a bit, but also not to forget that Maria exists, that Maria is there. And I think that the biggest thing we can do from our perspective here is oftentimes, whether as a wife or whether as someone who's seen as a bondswoman, um, Maria, regardless, gets written off into the side. Maria is just someone that is there, gives birth to a son, 
and disappears. And I think for our purposes, we can definitely give her that respect. We can say, anha. we can say that may Allah be pleased with her. We can lift up these things because she has an honor that none of the wives of the Prophet, especially his most favorite wife after Khadija, Aisha anha, had, that she gave birth to a son. So uh, making sure that the least that we can do is that we not maybe worry about so much about semantics here or there, or you know about certain things here and there, but at the least in both scenarios, we come out lifting up Maria. She was someone who came from another land. Imagine coming to another land, not speaking the language, not looking like these people, um, being very different in that aspect, looking different, uh, maybe having different mannerisms, but being able to uh, live in that society, giving up what you gave up, being in that society, being in the uh, in the desert of Arabia, which is not a harsh, which is not a, uh, a, a very, you know, uh, forgiving climate in comparison to what you might have in northern Egypt or so, but to come in that aspect and to uh, give birth to some of the, of, of the Prophet Sallallahu and to have that honor. So at least what we can do is retroactively give that honor to her and, and continue that and put her at the center of the story when oftentimes she's just seen as someone who's a vessel, but uh, she's much more than that. And regardless of where we go with that, uh, we can at least agree to lift her up in that aspect. So going on from this, and the Prophet ﷺ, as I mentioned, while he was in Medina, he continues to send out different expeditions. Uh, they, they go out. They're not necessarily hostile or against, sorry, against hostile, uh, against people who are not hostile. They're generally against folks who had in different ways, shape or forms, had participated in different battles or different attacks. So the Prophet ﷺ goes to kind of even uh, the odds per se. Um, and he also, it's very interestingly, uh, during this time, he receives word of the, the, the Negus of Abyssinia, the person who had, uh, the ruler who had given his his, uh, his Muslims, the amnesty when they were being persecuted in Mecca over 15 years earlier uh, has passed away. And the Prophet instructs his companions to pray uh, the funeral prayer for their uh, for their fallen brother, for their for their deceased brother. And so a lot of uh, most traditional scholars will say that the Nijus was someone because of this uh, was someone believed to have converted or someone who had attested to the truth of Islam. Um, so, you know, wh wh whether that's the case or not, uh, we know that the Prophet had uh, respect and owed this respect and even led a funeral prayer in absentia of uh, the Nijus. And so after the funeral prayer, after uh, the Prophet has come back to Medina, uh, we have one of the final main battles that the Prophet is, in, is involved in. It's listed as a battle. It's not really a battle. It's the, uh, it's the expedition of Tabuk. So more accurate to call it an expedition. So we have the expedition to Tabuk, which is in northern Arabia, uh, just you know, south of the border of Syria or so. And so uh, got by you know, maybe present day Jordan, uh, where, where you're kind of seeing it now, just that, that area that's around there. And so the uh, we know at the time politically what's going on is the Persians and the Byzantines are engaged in hostilities. It's a back and forth war that's gone on for uh, decades, if not centuries. And so eventually the Persians are driven out of Syria and of Egypt uh, by the Byzantines. And word spreads uh, in that time that the Byzantines are now planning to invade Medina to destroy the rising Arabian Empire. How true is that? You know that that history will remain to judge, but uh, it's it's probably not likely that the Byzantines saw the Muslims, especially as they're just you know keeping things within the uh, Arabian Peninsula as a threat. You know, there's there's not much that that is going on for them, and there's scarce references. Uh, to seeing these uh, the Arabians or the the Muslims or whatnot as a uh, legitimate threat or anything like that uh, within the uh, you know within what historical records that we have now. But again, you know, rumor of that spreads, and so there's a rumor of a hundred thousand man army that is uh, going to be sent to uh, descend on Medina. So we can probably see that it's probably not likely due to the size of uh, when when historians look back, uh, that was probably the size of if not if the whole Byzantine army, uh, if not twice that. So, you know, th that's a lot of people to be sending to a place that doesn't have primary access to water and is not really habitable or anything like that. So uh, it's it's likely that this is very much exaggerated in that aspect. But regardless, you know, the Prophet I'm hearing this, the Prophet I'm, uh, getting uh, the word or whatever it might be, um, calls upon the people the Quraysh, the allied tribes to march towards that north border to, to confront whatever army is there, whether there's an army, whether it's a confederacy, whatever is there, some kind of threat, the Prophet uses this moment to uh, unite the people to march in unison. So over 30,000 people or so, but he does this at a time that is seen as very, uh, 
very inhospitable. There is uh, a very um, you know strong drought. There's a hot season. This is generally the harvesting time. That's a very large enemy that we're hearing about. Um, and so there's uh, there, there's some there's some questions about what 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 should be done. But the Prophet Sallam says that you know we're we're going to go uh, and we're we're going to march. So sometimes you can look back at this expedition, maybe not seeing it as a military expedition per, so much to say that the Prophet Sallam had just essentially unified Arabia. And this was the one chance as well to get to actually make sure to show that that strength could be demonstrated, that the Muslim the Muslim state was something that moved as one. So maybe that was as, as is. But like I said, there's so many things you can speculate about. But what's very interesting is, as with all expeditions, as with all battles, it's not always the swords and the shields that are being hit that are the highlights, but the sacrifices that are made by people. And so we see in this case, some people of sincere faith stay back because it's it just doesn't make sense. It's so hot. It's all the stuff going on. So a few notable companions stay back, some people of sincere faith. And then you also have on the flip side, the narrative of sacrifice, because this is, you have a huge expedition. It's going to require a lot of um, people to come together. It's going to require a lot of armor, a lot of different um, transportation to be purchased. So how are we going to get this? We're going to uh, collectively fund it. And just a quick story here that, um, you know, at the time the process of had called for people that who can, uh, you know, help to fund and finance this expedition. And Omar radiallahu uh, anhu was not someone who was not generous. He was someone very generous, but he was like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to set the bar this day. And he goes and he, uh, you know, brings his wealth, uh, takes half of his wealth and takes it to the Prophet Sallallahu And, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, well, what have you left for your family? And he says, oh, I've left half of my wealth with them, but I'm giving half of my wealth to you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praises him. He's like, you know, that, that, that's very admirable of you. Omar. like, you know, may, may God bless you and all these different things. And then Abu Bakr comes. Abu Bakr comes and with all the wealth that he has and puts it out. Uh, and the Prophet asks him, he says, you know, uh, what have you brought Abu Bakr? And he says, this is all that I have everything that my family owns, all this wealth, this is all yours. And uh, the prophet asks him and he says like, you know, but what did you give your family? And he says, I've left with them, you know, the, the messenger of God and the religion of Islam. And so, you know, the prophet some praises him even more for that. And Omar says that, you know, after that day, I realized I'll never beat Abu Bakr. Like, you know, there's just another level of reaching a sacrifice like that. But the Prophet ﷺ made an example for, for Umar, for the rest of us, that when we do contribute to the faith, when we strive for the faith, we are responsible for the welfare of our family that, you know, what did you leave for the family is his response. What did you leave for the people at home? Um, and with Abu Bakr, again, that's an exception. That's an exception because of who Abu Bakr is, a man of faith like that. And so uh, when Omar is told, you know, give, uh, you know, to leave some with your wife or to leave some with your kids, to do that um, was, a, was a correct thing. But what Abu Bakr did in that sense was, was even more so, but for his, for his circumstance. We also see on the way to this expedition that his cousin Ali uh, was asked to stay back by the Prophet and was ridiculed because people were like, oh, hey, you know, the Prophet's not taking you, um, mostly by people who were known as we talked about the hypocrites that they, they ridiculed um, Ali and they said, oh, I guess you don't know how to fight. You can't do any of this stuff. So you're just going to stay at home. You know, you're, you're, you're not a, a real man. And the Prophet uh, you know, consoles him. The Prophet says, uh, no, you know, you are, uh, you, you are beloved to me and you're like to me like Aaron was to Moses and referring to a circumstance where when Moses went to Sinai, he left Aaron in charge. And so uh, Ali was asked to stay back to take charge of the city. And so in that sense, he was, he said, you know, you are like me as Air, like to me as Aaron was to Moses, except there was no prophet after me. And so he lifts up Ali despite this concept and gives him such a high regard. But we see the Prophet some in this element, not just being someone who is a black and white figure, but being someone who meets people where they are. Ali might have, you know, resisted and said, no, I really want to go. I want to go. And the Prophet meets him where he is and says, hey, look, beyond all that, this is where you are. Because Ali is known as kind of like the father of wisdom after the Prophet Sallam to inject this wisdom. And especially in the Sufi tradition, Ali is uh, seen as, as, as that, uh, as the um, the lead of this and to, to bring that concept of spirituality and uh, of purification and wisdom into the faith and mysticism. And so uh, there's, there's a very strong connection when the Prophet makes this reference, Ali understands and Ali, Ali knows. And so 
you know, there's there's other reasons that that are, that are going on there. But just to just for the sake of time, as I mentioned, some companions uh, had chosen to stay behind. Some companions were left behind because there's not adequate transport for them. Despite the collections, we see that the Muslim army was not one that was exceeding in wealth. Was not something that was uh, you know dressed in certain armor like the Roman army or anything like that. They were just kind of getting by with what people could put in. Um, so think of like a garage sale army. They're just they're just putting together what they have. They're not going to have the most elegant robes. And and banners and standards and all this stuff. They're just putting together what they have and they go with that. But some companions aren't able to go because of the fact that they don't have enough transportation. And so eventually for this uh, for this expedition of Tabuk, um, the Prophet Sallallahu and his uh, army reach uh, Tabuk uh, and they wait there for over 20 days. Uh, but alas, nobody shows. There's no army that shows. So whether it was a rumor, whether the other army got scared uh, is, a, uh, is a story for the, the history books. But eventually, uh, what's important here is the Prophet ﷺ comes there, doesn't see anybody, and he asks the army. He's like, hey, you all want to go back or you all want to go to Syria and we'll go find these people uh, that, that were said to be around our border. And the people, uh, his, his, his fellow companions say, let's go back, you know, let's go back to Medina. Uh, let's just let's just build up. Maybe later on we'll, we'll face these folks. Um, and he listens to them. Again, this is the Prophet of Allah. We've talked so many times where he will, he has the absolute prerogative to say what the people are to do and they will follow him. But when he asks them this, he gives them the agency. So leading as well by example is not just being there in the trenches with people, but also to take their opinion, to say, hey, what do you think? What is that? What about this? What about that? Um, so make them feel like they're empowered and really give them that agency. And the Prophet ﷺ did this despite being appointed as the leader, despite being given the authority of a prophet over them. And so from Tabuk, we see that there's, an, there's a deep faith that is there. There's a deep faith to be able to go into the darkness with, uh, with God's messenger, with the faith, uh, and not knowing what to expect, but simply just to go. That's all they did. They went and they came back. But there was there, there's that aspect that when we look back at Tabuk, was it a military expedition or was it something that was kind of like a faith building retreat? Was it something that showed them that, hey, we can move as one? We are Muslims. We uh, are the we are uh, singular in our faith. We are singular in being together. Now, let's see if we can actually do that. And there's you know, you can read between the lines and the gray areas so much of this. But uh, the important thing being that there is that aspect that is there now. Just to uh, speed through here, because I want to be able to cover um, the, uh, or I want to at least try to get to the farewell pilgrimage, but inshallah, that might be for next time. But just to go through after Tabuk, the Prophet was, uh, came back and again, heartbreak hits. Again, loss hits the Prophet house. And like I said, it's not something new to the Prophet The Prophet learns that his daughter, Umm Kulthum, has died. Um, she was uh, the daughter of. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ through Khadija. Um, she was also the wife of Uthman. She was the second daughter that the Prophet ﷺ had married to Uthman after Ruqayya had passed away after the Battle of Badr. Badr the uh, Prophet ﷺ had married Umm Kulthum to Uthman. And Uthman as well is overcome with grief. This is the second uh, wife that has passed away and this, more so the second daughter of the Prophet ﷺ that's passed away. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, while also grieving, comforts Uthman that if he had another daughter, he'd marry her to him. He gives him that honor that's there. Uh, and then, you know, so you have this, this additional loss that's there. So the Prophet is, uh, is continually facing a loss. And we, we'll talk about how the Prophet faced loss on all levels. There's not a, a relative, a type of relative that he had that he did not lose. And we'll talk about that in a second. But um, as I mentioned, some of the companions had deliberately you know, stayed back. They were like, no, we don't really want to go, or they just kind of wrestled, and then by that time, it was too late. Uh, the Prophet Sallam had accepted, again, the excuses of those who were known as the hypocrites, and just said that, oh, we couldn't join because this and this, and gave them an excuse, but the people who were actually of sincere faith, the people who actually made a mistake, he had uh, instructed the rest of the companions, he said, hey, don't talk to these people until God pardons them, because these are people of sincere faith, but don't, don't talk to them, don't, don't engage with them, uh, because their matter is with God. That's how, not just uh, how severe of a punishment they were given, but telling about how high of a level of spirituality that they had because, to, to earn something like this. Eventually, though, 50 days later, they were pardoned, um, and you see the story of folks like Kab, uh, Kab ibn Malik, who had said that, uh, you know, I would go to the prophet, and I would go in, in, in the mosque, and he wouldn't even really talk to me, maybe just, you know, just pretend like I'm not there. And the 
guilt and the shame and the suffering I would feel because of what I had done. But as soon as I was exonerated, you know, uh, a, a couple months later, it was as if kind of like he had become a new Muslim. It was just, you know, the Prophet some had uh, welcomed him with open arms. And you see the Prophet uh, is not operating here on any kind of selfish agenda. If these are people that were loyal to him, if he was just someone that was after this world, he's absolutely entitled to just say that, hey, um, I, I forgive this person, it's fine. But the Prophet some like he did with the matter of Aisha, like he did with any other matter, he leaves it up to God and he trusts in that decision. And so he has a lot of trust that's being given there. We see even uh, when we talked about the mercy of the Prophet when the Prophet is addressed as Rahmatalil Alameen, the mercy to all of humanity in the Quran, this mercy extends even to those who derided and, ch uh, and chastised him, even as they were Muslims. So we have Abdullah ibn Ubay, who was uh, known as the leader of the hypocrites, was someone who uh, helped to start the rumor of his wife's, uh, of the, um, of, of the, uh, the, uh, of Aisha's um, the, the the lie against Aisha in the sense that the scandal you know with uh, with regards to um, her infidel uh, her accusation of infidelity that uh, Abdullah ibn Obey was this person he would be someone who'd constantly be you know undermining the Muslims and it was well known but the Prophet some had told people to leave him like leave him let let him uh, even to his son he said no don't hurt him don't do anything uh, we we want to enjoy the good company that he may be able to have uh, we might uh, change his heart if we might but the Prophet some lifting this up even for someone who was on that opposite side of the spectrum and continued to undermine the Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ prayed for him, prayed for his forgiveness. The Quran says that if you pray 70 times, Allah won't forgive uh, those uh, hypocrites because they rejected God. And when he's burying, the Prophet ﷺ again leads this person's burial, puts him in the grave, leads his uh, funeral prayer as if it's a relative of his. And he, he has to deal with some upset companions of them, Umar, who says, why would you do this? This guy insulted him, insulted you for his whole life. And here you are praying for him. Here you are lowering him into the grave, going into his grave and lowering him. And the prophet responds beautifully saying that if I knew that God would have forgiven him, uh, I or forgive him. If I prayed past the 70 times that God had said, I would keep doing it. I would keep doing it uh, if I knew. And so you see the process of having this sincerity for someone who was uh, against his cause, for someone who was a hypocrite. And how much do you think he might have for someone who truly believed in him, for someone who truly loved him, and someone who uh, knows that you know, the Prophet was the one sent, but not uh, undermine him in any sense. And so uh, uh, Hamza Yusuf actually says that someone who knows the punishment of the fire, of the punishment that's to come, wouldn't wish it on their, their, wouldn't wish it on anybody sincerely, and especially those who claim to be a Muslim. And so uh, we, we see that uh, later on, Surah Tawbah prohibits prayer over uh, such people that the Prophet knew. You know, in our time, we don't know uh, people who might do this, who might be uh, have this type of hypocrisy in their hearts. And we're, we're taught to, to not look at that. We're taught to not uh, dig into that. We're taught to give them the benefit of the doubt. But in that time, because this had political implications, the process of them had, uh, had been instructed separately in this regard. But uh, we see that this was someone who was not a very good person, at least for the most of his life, and had done many things to undermine the Islamic cause. And the Prophet ﷺ was somebody who, despite that, had said, I'm going to try and pray for his forgiveness. Maybe he had that good in him. And it teaches us to keep being persistent even though uh, there might be people in our lives that really frustrate us. Uh, lastly here, we have um, 22 years after the revelation comes, the Prophet ﷺ is now 62. He's uh, going to pass away in about a year. And we see various tribes and delegations coming to meet the Prophet ﷺ, to come and to uh, enter into Islam. And we'll wrap up, inshallah, in just the next five minutes or so. But uh, they come to uh, the Prophet ﷺ, they, they see how much the uh, the Muslim community has grown, and they come to the Prophet uh, to accept. And many of these delegations, over 70 delegations come, but many people who come include individuals that were on the complete margins, that were like maybe marked as people that uh, are uh, going to going to get the short end of the stick if they if they come in, in front of Muslims. And uh, one of the examples of these was Kaab ibn Zuhair. Kaab ibn Zuhair was a poet, um, was known as one of the best poets, if not the best poet of the uh, Arabian Pen Peninsula at the time. And he wrote some really scathing and really bad remarks about the Prophet ﷺ. And so you knew he was a marked person uh, for his inflammation. But he very interestingly came to uh, Medina in the in the in just uh, you know in 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 the guise of uh, you know sincerity in the guise of 
wanting to forgive, and he truly had. Uh, and so he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu probably hadn't seen him before, and he asked after prayer, he said, hey, uh, would you even forgive uh, this guy named Ka'ab ibn Zuhair? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yeah, if he came as a, if he came and forget uh, and like asked for forgiveness, I'd forgive him. And Ka'ab ibn Zuhair said, I, I'm that person. And uh, we see that the companions initially said, oh, you're that person. They rushed to basically to, to eliminate him because of what he had said. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, leave him alone. He, he is, he's true in his, in his sincerity. We have Wahshi who had killed the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hamza which caused him so much grief. It was like a father figure that was, a, that was lost, a brother that was lost, and uh, even Washi being forgiven. We talked about how Hind in the, con in the conquest of Mecca, who had ordered this, uh, you know, and, and had done not just that, but had, uh, you know, mutilated the body of uh, Hamza, even she was forgiven. And so we see that uh, the Prophet is, is not someone who was just uh, labeled as the mercy of humanity or someone who's just preached mercy, but someone who acted it out with people who caused him immense pain. And then we see as well, this is not just limited to people of his own faith or community. The, um, the Jewish and Christians uh, of the Arabian Peninsula and different surrounding areas also send delegations, um, maybe not in a sense there to uh, convert, or some of them may have, but to come and discuss the faith. This is a new faith. This is something different. Let's talk about it. And there's a famous story of the Christians of Yemen or the Christians of Najran coming to the Prophet Sallallahu mosque, having a back and forth dialogue with him, him respectfully disagreeing and talking where his theology doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't agree with theirs. But at the end, when they say we have to do our prayers, he opens up the mosque and he says, pray here. This is, this is a house of God as well. So a lesson for us being in that, that we can disagree with people. We don't have to be, uh, you know, conformed to the extent to where we feel that we're 100% equal with people of different faith and different beliefs. We can have respectful differences with our theologies and whatnot, but that respect that we have for each other isn't something that diminishes. And the Prophet modeled this in seventh century Arabia. Uh, it should be something that can be not you know, something that should be intuitive for us in our time now. And so uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes uh, past these delegations that are coming, um, we see, and this is what we'll close with, uh, Ibrahim, his son, dies. He's, you know, maybe 18 months years old. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, I said, like I said, 62 to 63 years old. He had already buried five of his six children from Khadija. And he also had buried two of his wives, Khadija and Zainab binti Khuzayma. He had already buried them. And not to mention, he had already buried, uh, in a sense not buried, but he had lost an adopted son, Zaid. He had lost cousins, uh, Jafar, you'd recall, and so many others. He had recall, he'd lost his uncles. He had lost his parents. He had lost his grandparents. He had lost every type of relationship you can think of. The Prophet had lost um, and had experienced that loss, not just to say that, you know, this is something he, he, he was there, but to be alive and to experience that loss, to be a witness to that death, to be there. Um, just imagine the type of trauma that the Prophet had taken on, uh, that the type of loss he had in, endured was something that no one person generally in, uh, endures in their entire life. You know, usually it's generational as things go. So there's very special circumstances or very unique circumstances where entire families are taken away. But in this time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, over the course of his life, his 62 years, he loses everybody uh, in the sense, you know, he, he loses uh, the people most close to him. And so uh, we see that, you know, Fatima as well, his last daughter gives birth to her daughter, Zainab. Uh, so there's a joy of uh, Zainab's birth. The Prophet loved his grandkids. We uh, talked about how the Prophet would take the grandkids uh, of uh, his, take his grandkids, uh, the sons of Fatima, Hassan and Hussein, and he would hold them up on his shoulders. He would play with them, uh, you know, in the street. He would, while giving the Friday sermon, while giving the khutbah, his kids, uh, the, these grandkids are running around, he would pick them up and he would say praises of them, but he would continue his sermon while holding them. Uh, while in prostration in the prayer, they would come and jump on him and, uh, you know, just ride him like a, like, like a horse or like a kid does to an adult who's just sitting like playing a horse. Um, and he wouldn't get up until they get off. And so you see this love for the Prophet ﷺ for his, his grandkids as if they were children of his own. And you see a lot of that coming because he didn't really have a chance to have children like that uh, when he was uh, when he was a prophet afterwards, after, after Khadija, after coming to Medina, he didn't have that, that joy as much. So he lived it vicariously with his, uh, with his grandkids. And so this birth, though, this uh, happy, joyous occasion is overshadowed, though, by the untimely death of Ibrahim. As I mentioned, we'll conclude here with Ibrahim's death, that uh, this death was something that 
uh, took the entire community by shock. And it was something that for us as well today has lasting implications for how we grieve as Muslims, how we grieve as humans, and how we deal with loss. Just you know, 1400 years from there coming to today, that it's still that relevant for us. Ibrahim dies in the Prophet Sallallahu arms, taking his last breaths, taking his final breaths. Um, and the Prophet Sallallahu starts to weep, starts to just really let the tears flow. He starts to cry because just imagine what all had been going through, what he probably had in mind for this child, like what all future plans he had for this child. You, you think about that when we talk about people who have lost their kids in our society, what would they have been? Would they have been doctors, you know, engineers? Would they have been like, you know, artists, teachers? What was their future like? Would they have been like this kind of personality or that? Imagine the process of after having buried five of his kids, what he might have had and wanted in store for Ibrahim, all of these different things that he couldn't give to those kids. And so at that moment, he begins to just weep. And he's asked by a companion uh, who might have been like, like us or more of our uh, other brothers who, and sisters who might be a little bit more stringent on some aspects like this and saying, is this permissible? Are you allowing this like for people to uh, kind of cry like this? He wasn't wailing or anything, but he was just really crying. Is this, is this permissible? And the Prophet some responds gently that the one who does not show mercy will not be shown mercy. And that these tears, the, the, this, this, this crying is a prompting of tenderness and mercy. This is a, a, a sign of mercy. This is mercy. Um, that this Hadi Rahma, that this is, this is mercy. Um, and he says to Ibrahim, as Ibrahim has passed away, that we're sad for you. He, you know, he's talking to his son. He, you know, his son wasn't able to, you know, uh, get to that level where they would talk and have conversations like father and son. But he says, Ibrahim, we're sad for you. And the eye weeps. The heart grieves, but we'll only say that which is uh, pleasing to our Lord. And remember, also, when we talk about the passing of Ibrahim, the impact on the Prophet ﷺ, we don't forget his mother, Maria, who also just lost her son. One, one and a half years, uh, 18 months or so, uh, just born um, in a foreign land loses uh, his, loses her son. She has her sister, Sirin, who had come with her, and the Prophet Sallallahu makes sure to comfort them both. He, he gives them time to comfort them both, but also think about that. Think about what this impact had. Obviously, Maria was someone who was later honored, was someone who was given a type of state funeral, per se, was given uh, a, a, a proper funeral by uh, Umar ibn uh, and the caliph at the time, and given that honor. But think about what it was like at then. And we're going to close off with this last sentence here, that uh, at the time when Ibrahim passed, there was a solar eclipse that took place the same day. And so many of the people in Medina were like, hey, this is a sign that even like maybe God is sad or like, you know, th this is a sign that, uh, you know, even nature is, is, is acknowledging this sad occasion. The Prophet Sallallahu was so sad. This is also a sign. And the Prophet Sallallahu takes the time to say, no, that the natural world is a sign from God and God does not alter its course for any person's death. How many times we may, maybe see a prophet uh, or claimed prophet or a uh, miracle worker or somebody uh, of significance see some kind of natural event and say, see, that's proof that like, you know, what, what just happened was because of me or what just happened that my message is true or whatever. We, we see these types of things that come out. And rather, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminds them that even as the person who's sent as a mercy for mankind, even as the person who is, uh, who is given this type of honor, who has uh, bestowed this honor above all creation, says that, no, that cre that, that's a natural creation. It's a sign of God. It doesn't bend to the whim of any single person. Um, and so just thinking about this. And then next time, inshallah, we will conclude with the Prophet Sallallahu farewell pilgrimage. We'll see how the story wraps up, but also when the community passes away. Today in the but we talked about the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and tomorrow, in, or sorry, next, next week, inshallah, we'll be closing out with that. And what lessons the life as a whole for the Prophet has for us today. So I will go ahead and uh, conclude here. If there's any questions or any comments that anyone would like to make, you're welcome to share them. But Jazakallah khair and inshallah next week we will continue uh, this discussion.